here's our question here. We have a uh, tube or a pipe and water is flowing at four meters per second through this diameter right here. And it's going to open up the pipe. And we wanna know what the uh, final velocity going through this pipe is, as well as what is the final pressure that's going through there. And so we have two equations. We have the Bernoulli equation, and then we also have another equation that relates the rates. So we'll look at both of those equations there, okay? I gotta sneeze. Do I? Huh. <laughs> yeah, that was a sneeze. So uh, anyways, how do we figure out what the velocity is? Hey, Sean. How do we figure out what the velocity is and how do we figure out what the pressure is? Uh, what you gotta do is the velocity term is probably the easier one to solve for because the fluid flow rate has to remain constant. So the equation for the fluid flow rate is the uh, cross-sectional area A1 times V1 and that's gonna equal the fluid flow rate on this side, which is going to be A2, V2. And we're not given A, but we are given the diameter, so we should be able to solve for velocity two here. Um, and the first thing we wanna do is replace A1 with whatever it's equal to. So A1 is going to be equal to pi parentheses D1 over two, let's call it D1. We'll call it D1 squared times V1. And over on the other side, we'll have the area of this, which is pi times, now this is twice the diameter of that. So we could say that uh, D2 is going to be two times D1. So two times D1 squared. And I know that this is supposed to be the radius and not the diameter, but you'll end up getting the same result because diameter and radius are proportional. So we can do that. And we could put V1 there, the pi's cancel out, and then the D squared here, and you have a 4D squared here, and this should be V2. So we will get the velocity V2, equaling one fourth V1 and V1 is equal to four meters per second. So one fourth times four meters per second is just one meter per second. And so that is the velocity of two. So let's change that to one meter per second is the velocity that comes out. So you move in with a fast velocity, you come out with a slower velocity. All right, that's not so bad. Um, now that we have that, the next thing we wanna do is solve for pressure two. And to solve for pressure two, all we need to use is our Bernoulli equation and then start cleaning up. Well, the pressure here and here is gonna be different. It's wider, it's narrower here, wider here. So that's going to stay. Um, the height though, H1 and H2 are the same height. So that's gonna go away. Wah, wah, gone. And then we're left with this term and this term, which we know, and we can also get rid of the one half. Can we get rid of the one half? No, no, let's leave that alone. So we solve for pressure two. Pressure two is going to equal a pressure one and then plus one half the density of these two terms right here, which is going to be V1 squared minus V2 squared. And we know what each of these values are equal to. So C dubs is here. So when we substitute everything in for pressure one, we'll put in two ATMs plus one half the density of water, which is 1,000 uh, kilograms per meter cubed. And then the two volumes, it's going to be uh, four squared, which is 16 
minus one squared, which is one. And then we have to multiply it. Uh, what do we want? We want it in terms of ATM. So when you multiply this, you're gonna get Newtons per meter squared. And that's a Pascal. We don't want it in Pascal. We want it in terms of ATMs. So we're gonna use dimensional analysis and say that one ATM, one ATM is equal to 1.013 times 10 to the power uh, five. So the units here, whatever the units are here, which is Newtons per second squared, and the units here are gonna cancel out and you're left with ATMs. So what you should get, well, before I even plug it in, we should have an idea of what the pressure is going to be. If the speed decreases, if the speed decreases, pressure has to increase. And so let's see if that's what we end up with. When I plug all this in, I will end up with 2.04074 ATM. So it didn't increase by a lot, but because the speed decreased, the pressure in fact did increase. So that was the quick do now question. Let's move on to uh, deriving this Bernoulli equation. So I promised on Wednesday I would derive that equation. So let's do that. Oh. Oh. So take a second. If you need to, you can pause the video and see it again. But here's our picture here. Go ahead and draw it out while I close the windows. Okay, so hopefully you have this picture here. We can have a quick discussion about it now. So what we have is a pipe that's moving this way and then it goes up in height. The volume, the cross-sectional area, and the thickness of this is going to, well, the volume here and the volume here are gonna be identical because however much volume you push this way has to be pushed that way. So the thing in red is the volume and you get an equal amount of volume no matter if you go up or at the bottom. The cross-sectional areas are gonna be different. So the X values are also going to be different here. And so what we wanna do is come up with Bernoulli's equation. Um, and here's speed one, here's speed two. Remember this weird looking V stands for volume. So the V with a little dash mark is volume. The V without that little dash mark is speed, velocity. So how are we gonna come up with Bernoulli's equation from this uh, picture right here? The first thing we wanna do is talk about work. So work is defined as force times distance. You know that already. Work equals force times distance. Now there's going to be two different types of work. There's gonna be the work at the bottom and we're gonna compare it to the work at the top right here. Where the work at point one, this is point one here, is equal to the force multiplied by, or we could say the force at one multiplied by the displacement x1. So it's moving a distance x1 there. And something you should know, well, we'll, we'll talk, mm, let's put it in there anyways now. Force can be written in terms of pressure. So pressure is defined as force divided by the cross-sectional area. That's the definition of pressure. It's the force over a given amount of area. So the smaller the area is, the larger the pressure is going to be, okay? So if that's true, we could rewrite this equation one more time as uh, pressure one times area one times X one. And we can do the same game for this top work, and that's going to equal pressure two times area two times X two. So that's work one, and that's going to be work two. And what we're going to do is we're gonna look at the difference between the work. And the difference between the work is going to be the difference in the energies. So 
we could write it like this. Work 1 minus work 2 is going to be defined as the change in potential energy uh, plus the change in kinetic energy. Okay? So that's what work 1 minus work 2 is going to give us. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in work 1, work 2 with these values. I'm going to plug in for uh, U, and I'm going to be plugging in for K as well. So let's do that. Okay, so work one is equal to P1, A1, X1 minus P2, A2, X2, and that's going to equal the change in potential energy. So the potential energy is going to be in parentheses, we'll write it as M two G H two minus M one G H one. So that's our potential energy. And we're going to add to that the kinetic energy and the kinetic energy is plus one half M one. What are we doing? M two, sorry m2 v2 squared minus one half m1 v1 squared so this is our equation work that was this part is equal to those two right there now something you should note is that i wrote it right here density is equal to the mass divided by the volume. So if I solve for the mass, I could say that the mass is equal to the density of the fluid times the volume of the fluid. And so everywhere I see a mass here, I'm gonna replace it with the density times the volume. So let's just write this side of the equation down. So it's going to be M2, which is going to be density times the volume of two, GH2, minus the density, volume one, GH1, so that's there, plus one half the density times the volume of two, V2 squared, so this is volume and this is velocity don't get those confused, minus one half the density times the volume of one V one squared. So that's what this term becomes when we change in our density equation. Now something of importance here is what we acknowledged in the beginning. The volume that's getting displaced here is equal to the volume that's being displaced here. And so we could say that the volume at one is equal to the volume at two, which is just the volume. And volume, you know, is equal to A times X. So it's the cross-sectional area times the distance that you're going. And the other thing that's important because we're doing A times X here uh, is that the velocity we have this equation here, dv over dt is equal to a constant, constant, and that implies that a1v1 is equal to a2v2. So that's an equation that we've known from the beginning. Okay, so we have this information and this information. The first thing I can do is because I'm seeing this volume term in all the different places, I can get rid of volume because V1 is equal to V2. So let's get rid of volume here. Let's get rid of volume there. Let's get rid of volume here. Let's get rid of volume here. And so we have that. Uh, what else can we get rid of here? I think that's it. Ch -ch 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 
So we get rid of the volume. Um, and then what do I want to do? Let's, let's leave this term alone. We don't need that right now. From here, what I'm going to do is we know that all of this is equal to this term right here. Okay. So let me show you really quickly here. This term is equal to this term. Now there's terms with a in here. Oh, 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 oh. This is also volume here. So this side of the equation and this side of the equation. So a2, x2 is volume. So that term will go away. And a1, x1 is volume. That term will go away. So I divide volume from this side and I have to divide volume by that side as well. So hopefully you understood that much. I hope. I know it's summertime. So we have pressure one minus pressure two is equal to all this term. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate all the pressures on one side and I'm going to separate the, uh, sorry, the, all the objects with the one variable on one side and all the objects with the two variable on the other side. So if we do that, we'll have pressure one on this side. And then this term we don't want. This is minus. So this brought to the other side is going to be plus rho g h1. And then this is v2. We don't want that. But this is v1. We can bring it to this side of the equation. And we get plus 1 half rho v1 squared. So that's on this side of the equation. And we're going to take this pressure 2 and bring it to this side of the equation here. So that's equal to p2. Now what's left here? So this term went away. This term went away. And we're left with plus rho g h2. So that term's gone now. And this term plus 1 half rho v2 squared. And so what you can see is all the, wor the worms, all the ones and all the twos are like this, this equation is identical to this equation right here. And so what we can say is this is equal to that, which has to equal some constant. So the sum of these variables is equal to the sum of those variables. And that was Bernoulli's insight right there. Except we don't write it as like row one, H1, V1. We just say that pressure plus density times GH plus one half rho V squared is equal to a constant because you could plug in any number you want here. It could be pressure one, it could be pressure two, it could be pressure three. All the pressures at one and I mean all of these variables at one have to add up to all the variables at two which have to add up to all the variables at three. So this is a very important equation and you can do a lot of interesting things with this equation right there. So that was the derivation to Bernoulli's equation. And now you can see why we use it and why I was using it in the first lesson, because it works. Now let's do some problems and check your understanding of how well you know this. All right. I'm going to erase that. I'm going to erase that. I'm going to erase that. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to start off. I don't know if you can see that. We'll start off at the same value, and then we'll go up, and we'll go up to the same value. So it's the same cross-sectional area. And then all of a sudden, we're going to increase our cross-sectional area. And then we are going to decrease our cross-sectional area. And then we're going to go down like that, and we'll come, whoop, we'll do that for now first. So we'll come down, oh, this is spaced evenly, like that, there we go, that's beautiful. Oh, that's really nice. I'm impressed with myself. And then we'll decrease the cross-sectional area one more time. So that's the picture that we have, and we're gonna look at four different points, or six different points here. So this is gonna be point one, this is going to be point two. This will be point three. This will be point four. This will be point five. 
and this will be 0.6, okay? And I just wanna compare what's gonna happen according to Bernoulli's equations, what you expect to happen, okay? So let's just write down Bernoulli's equation one more time, and I'm gonna write it like this. Pressure not plus one half, not one half, plus uh, rho G H naught plus one half rho V naught squared is equal to pressure final plus G rho G H final plus one half rho V final squared. So I'm just rewriting Bernoulli's equation. And all I want to do, I'm not actually going to do any math here. I just want to know what will happen to the pressure as we move forward here. So going from one to two, let's see here. If we move from one to two, what's going to happen when you get to two? Well, H2 is going to be bigger than H1. It's at a higher height here. We can also say that the velocity one is equal to velocity two. So here the velocity isn't playing a factor, but the height is. So anytime you go up in elevation, the pressure should decrease. So what we would say is that pressure two is going to be less than the pressure at one. And so those are our three variables and that's the result we get going from one to two. Now, how about going from two to three. If we go from two to three, well, let's see here. H1, uh, not H1, H2 now. H2, the height at two, is going to equal the height at three. The height didn't change here, okay? Now, what about the speed? The speed, when you go into a fatter pipe here, the speed will decrease. So that's to say that V3, the speed at three, is going to be less than the speed at two. Now, if the speed at three is less, the final speed is less, if you start to slow down, pressure increases. So when you're moving, when the fluid is moving fast, pressure decreases. When the fluid is moving slow, the pressure increases. And therefore, the pressure at three is going to be bigger than the pressure at two. Then we move on from three to four, going from three to four. And if you don't want to listen, you can do this along with me. So you don't have to just copy what I'm doing. Do it yourself to see what happens. Here, the height at three is equal to the height at four. Uh, what about the speed? The speed at three is you're moving faster here. So it's going to be less than the speed at four. So think of like when you have a hose and you put your finger through there, it's gonna make the cross-sectional area smaller. So the velocity at four will get larger. So the velocity gets bigger. If the velocity gets bigger, the pressure has to decrease. So the pressure at four is going to be less than the pressure at three. There's gonna be more pressure here than there. Let's continue on. Uh, where am I going to write this? I'll write it up here. So the going from four to five, we have a decrease in height. So H4 is bigger than H5. The cross-sectional area remain the same. So V4 is equal to V5. And so since the height decreased, since the final height decreased, the pressure has to increase. When you go up in elevation, pressure decreases. When you go down in elevation, pressure increases. And therefore, the pressure at five will be bigger than the pressure at four. And then finally, we go from here to here. So we'll do that over here. This is going to be from five to six. So here the heights didn't change. The height at five is equal to the height at six. What about the speed? Since you've decreased this, the speed, since you decrease the cross-sectional area, the speed increases. So we have the speed at six is going to be bigger than the speed at five. 
And if the speed increases, the pressure has to decrease. So we would say that the pressure at six is going to be less than the pressure at five. So that's a conceptual check your understanding. If you got that, great. That was a, you know, it's supposed to be a pretty straightforward kind of ideas here. Okay. And now let's look at some examples and we'll do some more examples on Monday. So let's put that to the side here. Let's erase this. Whoop. And we can do our example. What color do I want to use? Let's use black. So this is the question from the the, the title or the, the what are they called? Um, thumbnail. Uh, we've got a canister here. And there's an opening here. And this opening is bigger than that opening. And we've got water inside. Okay, so there's a fluid inside. And then fluid's going to leak out from here. Now, a few things to note. The pressure here and the pressure here, since it's open, is both going to be atmospheric pressure. So this is open right here. This is open right here. It's going to experience uh, the same pressure. So this is P1. We'll call this 0.1. This is 0.2. So this is P2. And we can say that P1 is equal to P2 in this situation because it's atmospheric pressure. This is open. This is open right here. Uh, what else can we say? The height, the height of this fluid is 2.4, 2.4 meters. All right. Um, something else we can say is that this is the height from here to here. And then this height right here is going to be zero. So H2 equals zero. H1 is equal to 2.4. The height from here to where the water is being released is that much. Now, how about the speeds? We have V1 here. We have V2 here. How do we compare the speeds? Well, we can use our uh, flow rate equation, which says that dV, which is the volume, over dt has to equal a constant, which implies that a1, v1, is equal to a2, v2. And what can we do here? Let's solve for uh, v1. Let's figure out what the velocity of this water going down is. So if we solve for the velocity of the water going down, it's going to equal A2 divided by A1 multiplied by V2. Now, hopefully you can see what's interesting about this. The area of 1, that's right here, this is the cross-sectional area of 1, is going to be significantly bigger than the cross-sectional area of this term right here. What we're saying is A1 is significantly bigger than A2. So if that's true, if you've got a very large number in the denominator and you've got a very small number in the numerator, this is approximately going to be zero. So V1 is going to be zero, roughly. And that should make sense. If you've got a really, 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 really big tank and you, you like poke a hole with a, a needle and the water starts to flow from that hole right there, the water that's being drained out, it's going to move very, very, very slow compared to how much is getting pushed out from that little tiny opening. So the decrease of the water going down this way is going to be, or the speed of the water going down this way is roughly going to be zero when compared to the speed over here. Okay, so we will say that V1 is equal to zero, but we still don't know what V2 is equal to. Okay, uh, but now we can use our Bernoulli equation and figure out some things. So let's write down Bernoulli's equation. We have uh, P1 plus 
rho g h1 plus one half m1 v1 squared is going to equal, is that right? That Not m1, rho, rho times v1. And that's equal to p2 plus rho g h2 plus one half rho v2 squared. And we can cancel some things out. The first thing we can cancel out is P1 and P2 because they're identical. It's atmospheric pressure here, it's atmospheric pressure there. So that term goes away. Uh, something else we can cancel out is the V1. So V1 is roughly zero, so that term goes away. Over here, we said H2 is equal to zero, so this term goes away. And you're left with rho g h1 is equal to one half rho v2 squared. And then the rows will cancel out. And if we solve for v2, that's going to equal two times g h1 square rooted. And if we plug in for g and h1, we will end up with 6.86 meters per second. And that is the speed that the water is leaking out when it's at this height. When it's at a different height, then the speed's going to change. But all we're asking for is what is the speed of the water when it gets to this height right here? And the speed of the water that's coming out is going to be 6.86 meters per second. Something interesting, I'm hoping you noticed, I don't know if you noticed it or not, was this final answer right here. The final answer here is the same thing we would get if you take a ball and you drop it and you use conservation of energy. So conservation of energy, like if we had a ball here and we dropped it and we wanted to know what the final speed right here is, it would be mgh and that's would be one half mb squared and we'd end up with v final is equal to the square root of two g h. And that's what this result is, which which shouldn't be weird because we derive Bernoulli's equation using work. Change in work is equal to the kinetic energy change, so or the conservation of mechanical energy. So this result and that result are kind of similar, but instead of a ball being dropped to a final height here, it's water being pushed down to some final speed right there. All right. Now the last thing I want to mention, um, only because on Monday's class or Monday's lesson, we'll, we're gonna talk about it, is pressure and the way it moves. This is gonna be important for our questions going forward. So you can have, the way it works is, I'll just say what the, the way it works is, high pressure will always move towards low pressure, okay? Whenever you have an area with high pressure, it's going to move towards an area with lower pressure, or there's going to be a force, I should say force gradient, that's going to move at a lower pressure. And this is what causes wind. Wind is a fluid, it's, it's air. Air is a type of fluid. Uh, it's not a liquid, don't get that confused, but air is a fluid, and so fluids all do the same thing. They're gonna move from higher pressure to lower pressure. And the proof for that, I guess you could think of as dispersion. When you have a gas and it's compressed and you let it go, it's going to spread out. It's gonna go from a higher concentrated pressure area to a lower concentrated pressure area. And so it has to experience a force to push it away. Why is that going to be important is because of the examples that we're gonna do next time is when you have an area with low pressure, and you have an area of high pressure, there's going to be a force that you can experience. One example of that, that I could tell you right away, is when you take the subway, there's this yellow area in front of the platform that says you have to be behind that yellow area. The reason for that is because of this right there, and also because you don't wanna get hit by the train. But more importantly, let's say that this is my face right here. This is the train moving in this direction like that. When the train moves this way, it's gonna push air in that direction. So the space between me and the train, there's going to be air that's being pushed this way. 
okay? And when air moves, when air has a velocity, according to Bernoulli's equation, when you increase the velocity, the pressure goes down. So when the train is moving in this direction right here, there's going to be the fluid of air moving in this direction right here. And because it's moving in this direction here, there's going to be a lower pressure between me and the train as the train approaches. Why is that a big deal? Because the pressure behind me is larger than the pressure between me and the train. And so I have a higher pressure behind me. I have a lower pressure in front of me. And what's going to happen is pressure wants to go from high to low. I'm going to experience a force a little bit. It's not going to be too much, but I mean, depending on how strong you are, you're going to experience it very well. But depending on how fast the train moves, if the train is moving really fast, there's going to be a very low pressure. So what I should say is depending on the difference between the two pressures, the high and the low, will give you the amount of force that you'll experience throughout your body pushing you forward. So what they do is they put this little yellow mark there and that gives you enough space between them that you won't experience too much of a force. If you're really close to the train, then there's going to be a very low pressure between you and the train compared to the pressure behind you and you'll get pushed forward. So a difference in pressure will cause a force across the area moving you forward. And that just comes from the definition. So pressure is equal to force divided by the area. So if the different, when we can say the difference in potential, we'll give you the difference in the force. But uh, we'll look at that in the next class. Okay. Um, so that's it for today.